I'm Stephen Brenner, and it's my tremendous honor today to introduce Russ Altman as our keynote speaker. It's a daunting task because in the time allotted, I cannot possibly do justice to his achievements and career. He's difficult to pin down. He's a scientist, a doctor, and a talk show host on Sirius XM. He's also professionally pontificated at length on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. At Stanford, he's in the departments of bioengineering, genetics, medicine, biochemical data, biomedical data science, and computer science. Which means that nobody wants to take responsibility for him, and in fact, to become, he had to become chair of the bioengineering department to take him on. Among Russ's many awards are being elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and being a fellow of at least five professional societies, including AAAS and the International Society for Computational Biology, which awarded him last year the Outstanding Service Award. As president of the ISCB in the 90s, he prophetically declared revenue journals to be a 20th century idea. This nearly bankrupted the society, but it was the right decision. He's been chair of the FDA Science Board and is on the advisory committee to the NIH director. His CV also cites his award for excellence in classical Greek translation. Russ has had tremendous scientific impact in numerous areas. I was first fascinated by Russ's pioneering work in what today we call integrative structural modeling. To infer complex macromolecular structure, he combined disparate, imprecise, indirect data for numerous sources. Notably, he represented the uncertainty and created beautiful visual representations of these structures. Next, I was astonished by the success of an idea he called feature, which models protein functional and binding sites using fuzzy statistical data. The dogma at that time focused on using the precise geometry of key residues. So Russ's approach seemed heretical and actually frankly ludicrous. In fact, a recurring theme of Russ's talks is begging the audience for indulgence and to just bear with him as he presents something that seems frankly ridiculous or at least hopelessly naive. Like so many of his other creative approaches, features worked ludicrously well and has developed an entire suite of programs and tools for understanding how proteins work. And in fact, feature presaged the use of massive data rather than historical use of meticulous fine tuning in biological discovery. Russ has also been a leader in annotating human genomes, including participating in the first clinical analysis of a whole human genome. But in addition to recording the triumphs, he also warned of the risks in an incredibly important paper he wrote about the incidentalome as a threat to genomic medicine. It highlighted how even extraordinarily good tests applied across the entire human genome could lead to high false discovery rates and could cause harm rather than good. This paper was a decade ahead of its time, I would argue, and I encourage all of you to reread it and read it again. The transforming aspect of Russ's career, I think, was recognizing pharmacogenomics as a bridge between his basic science abilities and his medical training and aspirations. To this problem, Russ has brought to bear the full arsenal of computational biology approaches, including those I've just discussed. And for example, his approach has deployed an ever more encompassing suite of text mining methods, lately using deep learning and unexpected data sources, including the corpus of Reddit. He's also been an early advocate of rich data models, such as those embodied in the pharmacogenomics knowledge base he founded. PharmGKB has become the definitive resource in the field, both for foundational research and clinical use, with over 100 papers and hundreds of thousands of unique accesses a year. Now, I do need to disclose to you in this, talk, in this introduction that Russ suffers from an unusual disorder, horolmania. It's apparently genetic or maybe early developmental because it's shared with his brother. Horology is a study of timekeeping, and Russ is fascinated by fine watches. It's strange then that they don't apparently keep time because we've heard him repeatedly say that his wife restricts him to speaking about watches for two minutes per day. But all who have heard him surely have heard him speak about it longer than that. And since I'm sure Russ would never knowingly violate his wife's injunction, there must be a problem with his timepieces. So last year, Russ was enthralled by a watch that had a dual buckled tongue. The tongue is the little piece here that goes through the holes. And this watch had two of them, so in two sets of holes, so the watch would be safe even if one of the tongues broke. He may take pictures of, it, of him wearing it on the beach, and then we went way offshore and pictures of him underwater with it. And so given his concern, I got Russ a present. We have here this watch. 
And this watch here keeps time using high technology with a quartz crystal technology, and it can accurately count to two minutes. And this cost me 251 cents, which included shipping direct from the workshop where it was crafted in Cambodia. So Russ, I'm happy to give this to you. So Russ doesn't know this, but he was also responsible for one of the most significant decisions of my career. A colleague of Russ's and mine's was trying to convince me to get a medical degree because he said it would help me in my career, specifically at a faculty position. And my college clinching argument was this. Look at Russ Altman. He's a professor at Stanford. And my colleague said that without an MD, who would ever, who would ever hire him? And so with that, my colleague's credibility was demolished because beyond my own uh, admiration for Russ, um, he was just about to become the first winner of a presidential early career award funded from the National Library of Medicine. And so my colleague's argument was lost and my MD was abandoned. So Russ has helped so many people. His trainings can be found making discoveries in academia around the globe and also as data scientists populating Silicon Valley. As most of you know, Russ has been a founder and organizer of this meeting. Indeed, as Terry said earlier today, were he not, he probably would have graced this podium as a keynote years ago. Russ has also brought his own family here for decades, many members of whom, including the youngest, are here this year. And through doing so, he has helped create PSB as an extended family, a place for sharing knowledge, delight, and adventure, scientific and otherwise. Reflecting on this, Russ has often noted how his role in PSB was one of the best decisions of his professional career. And so along with that and the, of the organizers, Russ, I want to say that your role for PSB was also one of the best decisions for my career and for that of all of us here. So thank you very much, Russ. And so Russ, it's now my solemn duty to bestow upon you the insignia as the keynote speaker for the 24th Pacific Symposium on Biocomputing. That was wonderful. Okay, sound check, are we okay? Well, thank you, Stephen. That was um, really remarkably lovely of you and generous. And thank you very, mu very much, everyone, for being here. And I guess we're gonna get started. Um, for those of you who care, this is a Seiko SRP 775. Um, and thank you for the watch and the band. Okay, so I would like to talk today about informatics for understanding drug response. And a lot of it has been set up beautifully by Stephen. But first, uh, he made a vague allusion to the youngest member of my family. I do not have a new child. Uh, my actual youngest is 23 years old, and that's her at PSB number two or three, uh, jumping into the pool. I think this might have been in Maui, although it looks exactly like the pool here. Uh, and uh, when she started going to PSB, she was the same age as my grandchild, who was here a minute ago, probably isn't here right now. Um, so let's dive in. That, 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 that was the... Um, the connector. <laughs> okay, I'm, aloha, and I'm going to give uh, four things. I'm going to motivate why we care about understanding the molecular basis of drug response, and then I'm going to tell three stories, uh, quite separate, to give you a flavor for uh, what we're doing and how we're approaching it. So first of all, it seems obvious, understanding the molecular basis of drug response, but I want to stress what I mean by molecular basis is how molecular networks uh, of actual molecules, proteins, RNAs, DNAs, uh, uh, work together to, and how they are modulated by drugs, how the drugs might inhibit them, might uh, change the expression patterns to produce phenotypic changes in the patient that are beneficial. That's, after all, the goal, phenotypic changes in the patient that are beneficial. Drug response is much trickier than you might think because on drug labels and at drug companies, they tell you what they care about most for approving and selling the drug, but they don't tell you everything that the drug does. And so we have found it over the last decade or more to be an incredibly fruitful thing to try to find out what drugs really do. Uh, not just the, the headline activity, but the second, third, fourth, and fifth, which obviously uh, and clearly um, impacts the efficacy of the drugs uh, and their toxicities. So we'll talk about all of those. The motivation for a lot of this work is PharmGKB. You heard Stephen mention PharmGKB. I've been uh, working with Terry Klein and a, and a great team for 20 years now building this resource. It looks much better on a screen. It was not meant to be projected. 
Um, and please visit it because we still get credit for your hits. Um, uh, but the point is it's a database on how genetic changes in humans, genetic variants in humans, influence drug response phenotypes. And that has given us a license uh, to do research on the molecular networks that affect drug response. So we, we are very proud of the PharmGKB, and we're also very proud of all the spin-off research that it has generated, some of which I'm going to tell you about today. One of the key things in PharmGKB are the pathways we provide. These are manually, carefully curated pathways of how drugs work and how they're metabolized. They're very high quality. I hope you agree that they're beautiful. And this, you will hear work today about trying to turn these pictures into computational um, representations and models. We also, you can't see this, but this just shows you that we have actual data about human variation and how it, it affects drug response. You can't read this either, but what it tells you is that if you're taking an antacid, depending on the genotype at a particular position, if you got an A from mom and an A from dad, you're going to have a lower chance of having that antacid help eradicate your H. pylori, whereas if mom and dad both gave you a G, you actually have a better chance. So that's at the core what the PharmGKB is filled with. And in fact, two years ago, I opened up a clinical practice to actually help patients uh, genotype, get, get the patients genotyped, and help them understand how it might be impacting their response to drugs, especially when things are not going well. OK, so that's what motivates us, is trying to understand the molecular basis for drug response. Three stories today are going to be one on natural language processing to assist in the large-scale curation of gene-drug-disease interactions. Let me state that when I say gene, I totally am, am, am ambiguous about the gene and the gene product. But almost always, I'm talking about the gene product, not the actual DNA sequence, although sometimes not. So I apologize in advance. Hopefully, the context will make it clear. Second story is about how we use 3D molecular data to discover new uses for old drugs, repurposing. And then the third story is about patient-specific expression data and how we can use that to identify new drugs and new drug combinations for particular patients. Very new work. So first story. Characterize, and some of you have heard this. By the way, uh, I promise not to tell this. I love this work. But the person who did the work, I don't know if she's here. She's been here in the past. Uh, she's great, Beth Percha. She's an assistant professor. She needs to start talking about this now and not me. Uh, I just love talking about it. So this is the last time I will talk about this in public. Um, but I'm going to talk about it. Sorry, Beth, if you're here. Um, there are 30 million PubMed abstracts. They're filled with knowledge. They contain many assertions about the relationships between genes, drugs, and diseases. Uh, indeed, you could argue they contain everything that's been peer-reviewed on those relationships. And, we, and there are now advanced NLP techniques, natural language processing, text processing, that allows us to analyze every sentence, both in abstracts and, if you have access to it, full text. So we asked, can we characterize, and Beth asked, can we characterize all gene-drug-disease interaction modes, all the ways in which those entities can interact, and all the instances of those interactions? And this is work that Beth pu published in a couple of different places. Uh, there's Beth. She's now at Mount Sinai. And so the core of our work and relies on the ability to do par statistical parsing of sentences. So there's a sentence. C CYP3A4 is a very important gene for pharmacogenomics. Its mRNA expression was significantly increased by exposure. Rifampicin is a drug exposure to rifampicin in human hepatocytes. And you can run it through something called the Stanford parser, which my colleague Chris Manning and colleagues created. And they'll give you a parse, and they'll also give you something called a dependency graph. And this is a graph of the words that shows their relationships linguistically. So there's a lot there. And, and as a first pass, and a, and a very effective pass, you can just say, I'm only interested in the path that connects a gene and a drug. And that's the subset of that tree that I just showed you that shows that expression of, three, of CYP3A4 uh, is increased in the context of exposure to rifampicin. That's kind of the key, L, the key statement in that sentence. And in fact, at the bottom, and I know some of you can't see the bottom, um, I opted to have the biggest possible screen uh, so you can see all the slides a little. Um, 
and not any of the slides totally. But anyway, we can take that and we can actually turn that into a standard sentence that might occur in other times uh, for other genes and other drugs in the literature in a way that I'll show you in a second. So we create dependency paths from every sentence in PubMed abstracts that, that relate a gene to a drug, a gene to a disease, or a drug to a disease. Uh, and then we analyze that to try to learn stuff. So let me explain the basic idea with this cartoon. I'm afraid you won't be able to see this, so I will talk you through it. This is a bunch of sentences on the left. The first one says, a tenolol, a beta-2 adrenergic receptor inhibitor, which is represented in our system uh, as, as, as this type of sentence. It's very similar to, uh, uh, to the next sentence, a tenolol inhibits beta-2 AR. So they're saying the same thing, but they're saying them differently. Then I have similar sentences for lisinopril, which has a different target, which is called ACE, A-C-E. The key point in this picture, though, is that in our corpus, there are two sentences that are actually the same sentence with different genes and drugs. So sentence two and three, shown in red, the number two says atenolol inhibits B2AR. Number three says lisinopril inhibits ACE. They're exactly parallel construction, which suggests that those two pairs, atenolol and B2AR, and lisinopril and ACE, have the same relationship. That's the core idea in Beth's work, is that if you can establish the equivalence of some sentences, then you can build up a set of synonymous sentences that are all saying the same thing, and therefore you can, um, you can uh, project down to a much smaller set of basic relationships. So bear with me, as Stephen promised I would say. Um, so you have never seen, so all of the blue sentences on the right involve atenolol, and all of the green sentences involve lisinopril. Please bear with me. This is the only complex thought required in this talk. Um, so we see sentences that have been said about lisinopril that have never been said about atenolol, but we might imagine could have been said if they really have the same type of relationship. So there's a sentence that says, uh, number four says, lisinopril is an inhibitor of ACE. We have never seen atenolol is an inhibitor of B2AR, but if that red relationship means that they have the same relation, then we can infer that. Okay, so that's the idea, that by, in a data-based manner, looking at the co-occurrence of sentences, we can infer gene-drug pairs that have similar relationships. And I'm going to skip this last point, which is a, which is a more fine point. So we can take this, this gene, CYP3A4, and what you see here is a matrix where the rows are a drug-gene pair, and the columns are different sentences that have been observed between those, that, that drug and that gene in the corpus. So there's a drug called ciprofloxacin at the very top row, and you can see in this case we've seen one sentence in that upper left, that little red square. The second row is for quinidine in the same gene, and you can see that it has two different sentences, the second and the third row. Here, I have a pointer. So there's the ciprofloxacin. One sentence, quinidine, uh, quinidine, two different sentences. But then this third drug gene pair, which I don't even label here, because the key thing is that it shares one sentence with th this uh, ciprofloxacin and one sentence with quinidine and acts to enable us to unify those three as perhaps having the same relationship. And then we can go to, to, go to town. We can use that, in, that uh, observation to cluster in a fuzzy way lots of gene-drug pairs, and you can see that we wind up having a cluster here, a cluster here, and we would say that those are probably gene-drug pairs that have similar relationships. So in fact, we do a little bit of, you can see I've literally made it fuzzier, and what I can tell you is this is a bunch of inhibition relationships that are stated. This is a bunch of metabolism and substrate relationships. And now all of a sudden, from the data, we're seeing the different ways in which this gene CYP3A4 can interact with drugs. That's the big idea. So, Beth went into PubMed and created 50,000 gene-drug pairs. 
She did this clustering, so there's 197,000 sentences. She found all the gene drug pairs that had similar sets of sentences and, and said, okay, all these gene drug pairs, which are the rows, have a similar relationship. Okay, and she did that, as you can see, on a very large scale. And I would argue, discovered basically every kind of relationship a gene and a drug can have. Okay, so this is just so. Um, this is just showing you what some of the sentences are. This is a sentence type, a sentence type that occurs 1,200 times in PubMed with different gene drug pairs. And so there, there are a lot of sentences, fortunately, that are uh, shared. And then we just need those unifying ones to uh, resolve them together to figure out which ones are the synonymous sentences, like that third row that I showed you. Okay. So when she did this, she learned some obvious things that we all know, but this was totally data-driven. The sentence, drug is an antibody directed against gene, co-occurred with drug is an antibody targeting gene uh, a lot. And so she said, these are synonymous. And then she just played that game over and over to get a whole set of equivalent sentence structures across the corpus, which allowed her to draw this amazingly beautiful picture. What is it? This is the 50,000 gene drug pairs in a tree, shown as a circle. And then we have colored the clusters, and let's just take 25 for a set of somewhat arbitrary cutoffs, but not entirely arbitrary. We find 25 different gene drug relationship types based on the clustering that we get out of this analysis. So what are them? So this cluster here, if you look at the sentences, are all metabolic and substrate relationships. Dr drug is a substrate of gene, or all of the synonymous ways of saying that. And you can see we have tens or hundreds of gene drug pairs that are characterized by that type of relationship. Over here we have inhibit in inhibitory relationships. Drug inhibits gene, or any of the zillion of other ways you could say that. Again, hundreds or thousands of those. In fact, if you look at the inhibitory cluster, you can break it up into a subcluster that's kind of what we call general inhibition versus specific sentences that sound more like antagonism specifically as the mechanism of the inhibition. So what we found is the substructure of these clusters gives you more specific statements about the nature of the relationship. We have activation relationships, including agonists, or other kind of stimulation. And at the end of the day, with those 25 clusters, we have these 25 relationships. Very useful, because now, instead of saying a gene and a drug can have any kind of relationship, I would bet a fair amount of money that they're going to have one of these 25 relationships. Um, my favorite is the pair drug inhibits gene. Fair enough. But there's another one. You can't see it that way down here at the bottom. It says drug subtly inhibits gene. So it turns out that the algorithm was able to tell when you were positive about this relationship versus when you were using language in your sentences that was kind of hedging your bets. And it detected that and made them two separate clusters. The probably inhibits or subtly inhibits versus the definitely inhibits. So this is very useful um, for many purposes. One is we now have a closed world of gene-drug relationships. It's no longer anything can come down the pike. Our hypothesis would be anything that is published will be one of these 25. And in fact, when we went into PharmGKB, um, Beth was able to make it several predictions of things that were not in PharmGKB that but maybe could have. We brought it to our curators, and in many cases, the curators approved, so to speak, these new uh, uh, discoveries from the literature as ones that had been not previously curated and indeed needed to be in from GKB. Now, we can do a similar analysis for chemical disease, chemical gene, gene-gene, and gene-disease pairs. And in fact, before graduating, Beth did this. She found 37,000 chemical gene relationships, which she gathered into 10 of these themes, 10 types of relationships, seven themes for chemical disease, 10 for gene disease, nine for gene gene. Uh, by the way, these are all available on Zenodo. Knock yourself out. It's a pretty fun data set. Let me tell you a little bit more about it. So for chemical disease, the themes include chemical treats disease. That's like a drug. 
And so the sentences are, um, chemical may be useful for the treatment of disease. Chemical is approved for the treatment of disease. Chemical is commonly prescribed for, you can see, those are all synonymous sentences. She figured it out, she clustered them. We have treatment, inhibiting cell growth, side effect, prevents or suppresses, alleviates, reduces, plays a role in pathogenesis, and is a biomarker for. Uh, and we have two million statements like that available for you to use uh, cautiously, but hopefully productively. I won't go on to, in too much detail, but for chemical gene, we have 37,000 things, including agonism, antagonism, binding, uh, expression changes. For gene, gene, you can imagine. We have lip binding, increases expression, decreases expression, involved in regulation more generally. And then for gene disease, it's what you would expect, involved in the pathogenesis, causal mutations, possible therapeutic effect, polymorphisms, alter risk, now, I should be honest, all of the, in fact, I am honest, uh, all of these labels are us looking at a bunch of sentences and summarizing. So you could look at the same sentences and come up with slightly different labels, but we're confident that you would generally agree about what's going on in each of these categories. So we have this large database of typed relationships between genes, drugs, and diseases. It, we've been using it to rapidly generate genetic networks. If you want to, you just say, tell me all the interactions between this set of genes, and boom, you have a draft genetic network. You can do that for drugs or for diseases. Uh, you can use this to explain hypotheses. Is there a literature evidence for why this gene drug association is coming up? And you can look for motifs, um, all of which we're working on. The big challenges, determining which sentences are not true. We parse everything as if it is the truth. And we know that there are non-true things published in the literature. So we are working on, but determining the truth is also a synonym for doing science. So we don't really expect our algorithms to do science alone by themselves. So we feel that a structured representation of this information is useful, and then we have to build code on top of this information to figure out what might be true and what not, might not be true. That's a great challenge. We have not solved that. Single sentences that we've never seen before or we never see again, so we can't link it into that network of synonymous sentences. Those are lone wolves that we can't um, bring into the fold. And then, of course, relationships that are not stated in a single sentence. We're requiring that everything be in a sentence. So if you say it over two or three sentences, as of today, we'll miss it. Nonetheless, we think it's a pretty useful resource. And as I said, you can, you can grab it and play with it today. That's the end of the first story. The other stories are shorter. Switching now to using pro protein pocket similarity to discover new actions for old drugs. So there are about 100,000 3D protein structures in, in the protein data bank, and we, we have known for some time that similar protein pockets often bind similar ligands. And we have this algorithm, pocket feature, it's related to the feature algorithm that, that Stephen mentioned, that assesses pocket similarity. So we asked, can we use pocket similarity to identify new ligands that bind existing drug targets. And this is work uh, by Ben Lowe, a postdoc in the lab, uh, with experimental collaborators Olga, Olga Cormier and Tim Stearns from the Stanford Department of Biology. It'll be very clear when I get to the experimental data based on the, uh, my depth of understanding and my uh, detailed uh, annotation. So microtubules are tub tubulin polymers that are critical cancer targets. Turns out that cells use these to build their cytoskeleton. Microtubules are constantly being polymerized and depolymerized, and if you throw in agents that mess up either the polymerization or the depolymerization, you can mess up the growth of all rapidly dividing cells, which includes cancer cells. We have the structure of tubulin, and there are at least three binding sites. Uh, and one of the most famous binding sites is the taxane binding site, which is where uh, paclitaxel and other taxol uh, anti-cancer agents bind. Ben was interested in knowing, can we find other drugs that can bind that taxane pocket? He used our feature system. 
features this weird system that represents a microenvironment about 10 or 12 angstroms in diameter uh, as a set of statistical features. It, it basically linearizes the 3D structure into a vector of numbers, and that vector of numbers can be used for all kinds of informatics purposes. So this is just to show you that we have um, an environment here. We've created concentric shells. We've counted up the occurrence of atoms and different physical and chemical properties, and we turn it into a vector of numbers. The pocket feature algorithm looks at these vectors of numbers and determines if two pockets have a statistically significant um, overlap in, their, in the presence of these microenvironments in a binding site. So here we have a binding site in a protein for FAD. Uh, and here's the FAD. And we can see each of these balls is one of these vectors. And the balls have been colored so that similar colored balls are similar vectors. They have a, sh a small distance between them. And in this picture, all we're showing is that for these two non very distantly related proteins, um, they both bind FAD. But notice that, the, that we have red, yellow, orange, red, yellow, orange around the adenine part of the FAD. But over by the ribose part, we have purple, green, red, and then purple, green, red near the ribose. So we showed in this initial paper that we could detect pocket similarities using these um, colorful balloons, if you will, and the similarity in the balloon colors across two binding sites. So um, I know this is hard to read, but it's just a pipeline that Ben created to take beta tubulin compare it to many, many pockets looking for similarities. And what he found, and you also can't read this here, but I can tell you, I think there's some little red circles to, to direct your attention. Very surprisingly, the estrogen receptor pocket, that is to say the pocket that binds estrogen and anti-estrogens in the estrogen receptor, it was um, the most common hit to tubulin similarity in the top 40 hits uh, of, in this screen. So that was a big deal, because nobody expected tubulins and estrogen receptors to look similar. Here are some estrogen receptor um, modulators, or CIRMs, often used to block estrogen receptor, typically in breast cancer. Tamoxifen and raloxifene uh, are approved drugs, and there are other experimental ones. These are just show their structures. But here's what I want to show you. Here's the taxane pocket, the taxane pocket in tubulin. Here's the estrogen receptor pocket. And all I really want you to notice here are that the balls are the same colors. So we have a red, blue, purple, and we have a red, blue, purple, and we have like a yellow, orange, purple, and we have an orange, an orange, purple. And it, now this is a little bit you're trusting me. But the statistical, the, the statistical chance of sharing that many similarly colored feature environments, feature vectors, or colored balls was very low and very unlikely to be by chance. And that was the source of these predictions that these molecules, which are known to bind the estrogen receptor, might also bind the taxane pocket. Now we get into the experimental work done by Olga and Tim. So first of all, if we look at cells, and if we look at uh, control cells, which are normal, and cells tr treated by taxol, a known, obviously, taxane, raloxifene, the anti-estrogen, and, and you really will have to trust me on this, does not look normal, looks much more like the taxane-treated cells than like the normal cells. And we can quantify this. In addition, when we look at uh, the presence of microtubules, you can't see, but there's a, like a bunch of lines here. And they are not seen in controls, but they're seen in taxol, and they're seen in the antiestrogens. So the theme here is that a series of experimental uh, studies supported this binding relationship. Here is the, uh, an, an assay for the stabilization of microtubules. And here's the taxol performance 
And you can see that raloxifene, the antiestrogen, is number two of all the, of all the assays that we ran. And finally, uh, I think in response to some reviewer insistence, they want to know, can you prove that your SERMs, your antiestrogens, are really binding this, the beta tubulin taxane site? So we did a fluorescent tag on a known um, taxol, uh, and you can see that, in the, that it binds uh, in, in the control, but if you outcompete it with taxol, there's no binding. This is empty. You can also outcompete it with, the, with, with raloxifene, uh, the antiestrogen. So all of these things uh, added up to, we thought, quite persuasive evidence that antiestrogens are binding tubulin and inhibiting polymerization much in the way taxol does. Very unexpected. People said, well, maybe this is because um, anti maybe the cells that you're testing on have estrogen receptor and you're killing them that way. And so this just shows that the antiproliferative effect of our antiestrogens is independent of whether you have estrogen receptor on the surface of your cell or not. So it's clearly not acting through the estrogen receptor. And based on this data, it's acting through the tubulin. Then we go back to computation stuff where we feel much more comfortable. We're docking this to the taxane site to figure out exactly where the contacts are being made. I won't go into the details. And we're building a structure activity model to see if we can improve the ability of estrogens to, to bind the taxane pocket. So why do we care about this? So first, we have this major pocket similarity between tubulin and estrogen. We have shown that the antiestrogens bind tubulin and have functional effects similar to taxol. This is entirely news. This was not known. And it, uh, by the way, we're also checking if taxols have antiestrogen binding. We haven't gone down that half of the story yet. But this is incredibly important because uh, antiestrogens have been used with the presumption that their primary effect in breast cancer and others was in blocking the estrogen receptor. And this result suggests that they might also be working because they have a synergistic effect blocking microtubules. And that's why they may be too good to be true, so to speak, in some settings where the estrogen receptor count is not very high, and yet you're still getting an anti-cancer effect. It may be through the tubulin binding. So we're excited about that, and that's uh, in press uh, right now. End of second story. And I think we're OK for the final story. Network-based methods for patient-specific drug selection. So here's the setup. We all, I think we all know that there's a large database of patient-specific expression profiles for many diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease. There's a large database of cell line expression responses to drug exposure. Many of you know about the connectivity map and the links resource. And we know that we need new drug treatments, including drug combinations. And so we asked the question, can we develop network-based me network methods to use patient-specific expression data to choose new drugs or new drug combinations? And this is work done by Li Chi Han, who's an MD-PhD student in the lab, in collaboration with uh, collaborators at Pfizer, uh, Lovisa, Mateus, and Daniel. So I'll briefly remind you that inflammatory bowel disease is quite common. It includes both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but with a big overlap of the two diseases. And it's characterized by pretty severe inflammation of the affected uh, parts of the colon. Treatments are not that great. They start with kind of nonspecific anti-inflammatories, and they go up to quite specific modern biologics. Um, they are routinely either a little successful or sometimes very successful, but sometimes not successful. And surgery is often a failure because you say, I, we just have to take this segment of bowel or the entire bowel out. So there really is a need. Uh, and in fact, uh, Atul Butte and his co-workers um, recognized this and recognized the value of these data sources. And uh, now, you know, eight years ago, published um, computational repositioning where they proposed that one way to do this, and this was also in the Lam et al. paper that announced the connectivity map, that if you take the profile of a disease and you rank the genes by the um, most highly expressed to the least highly expressed, you can look for drugs that kind of reverse that pattern, send the high ones down, send the low ones up, tending it back towards 
normality, then that might be a reasonable way to generate new drugs. And in fact, they proposed topiramate as a drug that might be a useful treatment for um, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and then took that far into um, uh, trials and, and whatnot. Um, there are a couple of issues there. The first thing is that the profile of the Crohn's disease is often averaging over many cases of IBD. And we know that ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are different, and there might be differences that matter uh, in individuals. And secondly, we know that these genes work together in pathways. And we kind of were looking at a marginal distribution of, that, of those expression data, and we weren't using the pathway and network information. So Leachy's somewhat simple question is, can we build a model using network data to improve that approach? And so I just want to take you through what she's doing. So we think of a gene interaction network, and then we think about adding drugs that are going to modulate that network. That's the model. We are going to parameterize the network using gene expression data from these CMAP cell lines where they expose genes, they expose cells to drugs, and then they measure gene expression. So this is, these are, this is an experiment where you've, expo you've measured the gene expression uh, to the cell line. In this case, you've added some drugs, some other drugs to the cell line. So if we have this network, we have the genes numbered. Here are the genes 1 through 7. Here are the drugs A, B, C, and they're shown in the network. And let's say we want to predict the expression of gene 1 as a function of the things that it, that it, it um, connects to in the network. So there's gene 1. It, it is in, influenced by uh, drug A and gene 6. And so Leachy creates a very simple logistic regression to predict the expression of 1 based on uh, you know, uh, us using linear regression, uh, the, the expression of gene 6 and the presence or absence of gene A. So A, 6 are going to go into and predict 1. And she builds such a model for all the genes in the network. Now, she can take a single IBD sample from a single patient. So this is colon sample where we measure expression, and we overlay the expression of those genes onto our network. So we have that. Now she says, what happens if I turn on this drug? Well, what she's going to do is she's going to propagate the effect of this drug through the network to update and predict what the IBD sample would look like after propagating the effects of this drug through the network using those regression equations. So you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but there's one gene there that I'm changing its value. And then that gene, this value changed, and that affected these two. And I propagate that through the entire network to try to get a new set of expression data, which I'm going to call my drugged sample. So I have an individual patient. I pretended like I gave them a drug. I propagated the effects of that drug based on the CMAP data through this network. And now I have the predicted outcome of giving that drug to that patient. I can do that now for pairs of drugs as well, shown at the bottom. How do I create a ranked list? Pretty straightforward idea. We make an average healthy profile. This is healthy colon. We now take our drug sample and our healthy sample. We calculate some distance metric. And the drugs that get us closer to average healthy are ranked higher, simply by how close they get us to healthy. So very similar to the ideals of Lamb and Dudley, but a little bit more sophisticated with the use of the network data and the individual, model, and individual patient data. That's an overview of what I just told you. Let me just show you some of the results. This is what we used for the data, the connectivity map. Drug Bank gave us our gene targets. We used the Reactome network, and we used uh, GeoData for our, um, for our expression data, uh, multiple data sets. This is the one for validation. So first thing, uh, as a, as a, this is another, you can see everybody in my lab loves this software for creating circular colorful pictures. Um, this is just showing that in region, if you cluster so now we run this on multiple examples of patients. So I'm throwing away the patient specificity so I can give you some summary statistics. If we run multiple drugs through multiple patients, we find that similar drugs have a, that have a similar mechanism. 
uh, cluster together. So that's just a confidence builder that we're not doing something absolutely random. The drugs are clustering together as you would expect. But here's something interesting. We see two main clusters. The first are, is a cluster of drugs characterized by neuropsychological drugs, alpha and beta blockers, and some immunomodulators. That's in blue. And the second cluster is mostly anti-inflammatories and steroids. And they are the first big split in the clustering of drugs on uh, IBD. And in fact, there are a set, the patients follow the same clustering. There are a group of patients that seem that they're going to respond better to cluster one, and a group that looks like it's going to respond better to cluster two. And those go together, obviously. Um, uh, so that's interesting, because that was not something that was generally known to us, and as we talk to our IBD colleagues, maybe even not generally known to them. But let me show you um, the average single drug ranking. So for patients in that purple group, here are the drugs that um, come up most often as likely to normalize the expression. And here are the drugs in group B. And there are, there are different, I think, I think non-overlapping or barely overlapping. In red, I'm showing known drugs that are known to treat IBD or are in clinical trials for treating IBD. So this was a huge confidence builder that without providing that information, we're recovering many of the known drugs. And then, of course, the ones that are not in red are what we like to call intriguing hypotheses, or else false positives. As I said, we can also turn on two drugs at a time. And so here are the average drug pair rankings. And what, what I love about this first one is in group A, uh, this is a, a diuretic and a pretty strong uh, actual, actually vinblastin relates to the second story. This is a anti-microtubule drug. Um, and these drugs individually do not rank very high. This is out of about 300 drugs. This is 35. This is 199. But together, they um, have the number one ranking. And that, that's exactly what you would want. You would want evidence of uh, synergy. And then there are these other pairs for group A and other pairs for group B. I'm showing you the averages over multiple patients. But remember, the section here is that we can also make these predictions based on a single patient to do uh, precise prescribing based on their specific profile. The way we're taking that is we're uh, running mouse experiments now where we've induced a pretty good model of IBD. It's not great, but it's pretty good. Uh, and then we are trying some of these drug pairs that we've predicted that are very unexpected to see if they give us an um, improved uh, response. So we're pretty excited about this, and we like this model as a general, I'm just going to go back to the picture. We like this model as a general purpose way to think about both single and combination drugs, using expression data, uh, and propagating it through in, in reasonable ways. And in fact, one of the main research questions is what's the best way to represent this network and the best way to propagate the effects, the predicted effects of the drugs. OK. So the conclusions for this section is we can model drug effects with networks to integrate patient state and drug effects. Drug effects are from the cell lines. The patient data is from their actual colon. And we're trying to do the best we can to bring them together and predict effects. The application to IBD patients reveals two clusters of patients generally associated with different sets of drugs that we predict they will respond to. We can model single as well as combination drugs. Our independent debt test sets have worked pretty well, and the experimental validation is pending. Uh, and we're cautiously optimistic. That ends story three. So let me just finish up. Pharmacogenomics drives a lot of our research questions because it's all about molecular and cellular responses to drugs. And we've learned to have a healthy distrust of um, current theories about what drugs do and why they do it. There's many examples where that's very much of a partial story. And so a lot of the work that I'm describing can be thought of as elaborating our full understanding of what drugs do. That NLP project looked at extraction. And we have millions of instances of relationships between genes, drugs, and diseases that can be used to create networks, to analyze data. We think it's a useful resource. 3D structural methods can discover the novel binding. And we showed that the antiestrogens look like they are anti-tubulins uh, as well in, in many cases. 
And finally, network methods can use patient-specific expression data to propose new drugs for patients and new drug combinations for patients. This might be a really uh, powerful way to really realize precision medicine. So with that, I want to thank uh, all of our funding sources. I want to thank the firm GKB team. I think I've already shown you the people who did all the work, so I'll thank you for your attention, uh, and aloha. Wow, Russ, thank you for a very, very, very insightful talk. I've, I've seen part one before, and we've talked about it a yes. lot, so I'm going to ask you about parts two and three. So uh, for, for part three, um, personalization and, and sort of, you know, uh, this idea of a drug for each patient or a drug combination for each patient very frequently is in, interpreted uh, in the broader community as every patient gets their own drug or their own drug combination, whereas what you're showing is the fact that it doesn't matter you know, which person, maybe it's that whole group. Right. So my question is, if you went further in resolution and basically said, I'm not just going to put people into two buckets, but I'm going to say, and here's the combination for each person, would you trust that further subdivision? Or would you basically say that the predictions are really more, most robust here, and if we go further, we're going to be fooling ourselves? So it is a great question, and, ju and just, I, I think it was clear, but just to repeat, the high-level question is, this is two clusters which are attractive for two big groups uh, and, and which you could study in a clinical trial by having your patients be stratified and then tr treating them. Whereas if I go all the way down to the individual, I might be very happy about my ability to personalize, but there will not be a clinical trial. There will be no statistics. And I'm kind of, what the heck do I do? And what the heck do I tell a physician about what to do for their patient. So I think you, there's no doubt that you're right, Manolis, that in the first wave of this, you do all of this patient-specific stuff, but then you have to aggregate it and turn it into these somewhat unsatisfactory buckets because you, because you can test these and you can validate them. Um, I am also, however, interested in figuring out ways how we could get that personalized um, uh, and the, the kind of thing it would have to be would be, it would have to be very bad cases that have failed individuals who have failed all other treatments, very similar to cancer, where because of your desperation, you're willing to do a series of N of 1 trials and then bucket those results. Very painful, long work, so this is clearly the first way to go. Very but cool. I don't think we should give up on the absolutely personalized, because it's just a great goal. Yeah. Thank you. Now, for part two, those pockets were yeah. a little further away from the molecules themselves. So I would have naively expected when you first started your presentation that they would be kind of touching. But, you know, they were sort of, you know, five of them were a little further away, different orientations, et cetera. How should I think about the pharmacodynamics and, you know, the, 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 the molecular genetics yes. Yes. governing that? Is it that the molecule is folding and touching this at varying rates? Is it that it changes conformation, bringing these circles together on the molecule? How does it? Yeah, so um, what we're doing with machine learning is um, very different from what a physics-based method would do. And in physics-based methods, which of course we're all rooting for physics to win eventually because we all kind of believe F equals MA and it should work. The problem is those models right now are exquisitely sensitive to small differences in the structure and which can have huge differences in the energies. So, and, and Stephen made very nice reference to this in his introduction. The feature system specifically is a low resolution method. And so the reason some of those balloons look like they're not actually touching is I believe that what they're doing is they're describing environments that have overall elect, uh, electronegative or electropositive features or overall dynamic features that are different or perhaps um, hydrophobic or hydrophilic um, reactions, and so what's, the reason it's okay for them to be a little bit far is as the molecule breathes, some of those side chains are going to dip in and dip out, and we're not capturing any of that, but what we're capturing is the tendency of that type of feature to associate with binding the ATP, or, and so that's, I think that's what's yeah. going on, and it's an advantage of the machine learning, which because it's not sensitive to those 0.5, 1.0 angstrom differences, has some freedom to see the correlations that might otherwise be missed. Fabulous. Thank you very, very much. So I wanted to uh, give uh, some time to story one, because we only get questions two and yeah. three. And it relates to this idea of an un somewhat unsatisfying bucket. I'm, I'm a little surprised that the themes from, from story one came out as sort of, at least the way they're portrayed here, is just this set of disjoint themes, as opposed to some kind of ontology that shows logical relationships among them, but also 
uncertainties and ambiguities. So, so that's my mistake in presentation. Okay. <laughs> so random cuts, not random, somewhat arbitrary cuts give us 25 bins, but those 25 bins lose all the beauty of this hierarchical structure where it is exactly ontologically satisfying. And so how do you, I guess the question is, how do you make use of that ontolog ontological structure in downstream tasks? Do you have when the, to do that? When the bucket is big enough, I'm willing, so this bucket was big enough that I was willing to look at these sub-buckets and they made perfect sense. Where you get uncomfortable is when you only have five or six examples. And so you say, I'm not sure I really want to label that as a coherent bucket yet because I haven't seen enough of it. But so we do have little clusters. Here's a cluster with only four examples. If, if you gave me a, gene, a new gene drug, wrote a bunch of sentences about them, and if I landed there, I might be tempted to say, okay, it's an example of this sub cluster here, but th there's a, just a judgment issue about how much do you need to see to believe that that's a real subcluster. In some cases, we definitely see enough, and that's why I, I went back to this picture where, you, where I didn't stress it, but where we really did have, like 25 gets broken into A, B, C, D, E, and they're all sibling concepts that are all sub subtypes of the overall cluster 25. And, but are there possibilities for something to exist I mean, it seems like you could have multiple themes related to a given pair, so it should appear on the lower right, at, you know, and also at 11 p.m. on your circle. That's a great question. I think by construction, we have not allowed that. So it's on the assumption that a gene and a drug pair will have a certain type of relationship and it will land somewhere. If you have a disjoint set of sentences, let's say there's a competing literature where group A thinks it's an inhibitory relationship and group B thinks it's a, um, an activating relationship, uh, what would the algorithm do? It would be very confused. I don't think it would place them in both. I think it would maybe even create a new subcluster of the confused group. But that, that's future work. Haven't solved that. I think my, my question is along the same lines. Uh, it has to do with, have you consolidated, I guess, the sentence level predictions, like these two entities have this type of relationship, into an overall like probability that that relationship exists of that type? Great question. All the work in the lab. So Beth left, but my lab is left with this and very excited about it. And all the work in the lab right now is trying to put probabilities on all of this so that we can have high confidence, medium confidence, low confidence, or even a quantitative scale. So that you could come to me and say, Russ, give me the inhibitory relationships that you're positive about. Uh, and so we are looking at the level of support in the literature, the ease of parsing the sentence and how clear it is and stuff like that. But right now we don't have it. Um, if you go to the Zenodo site, she has something called support level, and that is simply the number of sentences that support that relationship. And so we use that as our quick and dirty, but there's a million reasons to think that the number of times something is said is only a little bit correlated with the likelihood that it's true. Thanks. Think about that. That's an important lesson for life. Just because you've heard it a lot doesn't mean it's true. Hey, Russ. Well, thanks first and foremost for the wonderful meeting that you and your colleagues have created over the years. It's just awesome. Um, <laughs> well, I have, there are co-organizers, and they're very Having talented. been here since the beginning, more or less. Uh, just a question about the dynamics in the system. And the, it could actually go apply to almost all your stories, certainly two and three. But let's focus on two. I mean, one of the things that we've noticed is if you look at traje MD trajectories and then you look at pockets, uh, you actually can detect pockets in part of trajectory that are not necessarily in the crystal structures. So I'm wondering if you've played around with that and what your thoughts are on that in, uh, with respect to that kind of dynamic behavior. Yes, so we, in, in other work we have shown, just to, just to agree with you, in other work we have shown that even a short molecular dynamics trajectory on one of these proteins changes your understanding of where the pockets are and how many pockets there are. We took a static structure here and used one of the standard pocket finders. Um, of course, especially for allosteric um, in, uh, modulators, you would love to see a few nanoseconds of MD. Sometimes a pocket opens and it would be lovely to then see if we could use pocket feature to find uh, small molecules that might 
lock the structure into an inactive form. Haven't done that, although in other settings we have shown that to be very valuable. The only reason we didn't do it here is we were being greedy and lazy, and since it looked like a good hit, we could go for it in the main pocket. Uh, but if you had a negative, if you really wanted a drug tubulin and you couldn't find a pocket feature hit, the thing to do would be to do molecular dynamics, look for new pockets that were unrecognized in the crystal structure, and then try to drug those new pockets. Yeah. So Russ, I want to thank you for a really fantastic talk. Let's all thank Russ. I'm standing over here because there were many more questions. I'm sure that everyone will have an opportunity to speak with you over the lunch, which will be coming next. I want to thank everyone who's here for coming to the session. and.